Scott Fickner, injury attorneys, we fight for the win. Good morning and welcome to the Overall Podcast brought to you by the Scott Vicknair Law Firm. This is your co-host, David Vicknair, along with my law partner, Brad Scott. Good morning, Brad. How are you doing? Good morning, everybody. Good to be here today. And we have a great episode for today. Incredible guest I've been looking forward to have on the show since we started this podcast. Very good friend of mine, Ms. Voris Vigi. Uh, Voris, I have known quite a while now through various roles that she's held with an incredible local organization, Volunteers of America of Southeast Louisiana. In my initial journey with VOA, uh, becoming a volunteer and a, and a donor, I've just gotten to know Voris uh, casually at first, and then through different roles in the organization, got to know her better and better. And she became a person who I had a ton of respect for over the years and have really looked up to and and really admire the leadership that she's providing to that organization, which we're going to get into as president and CEO today. And so we're super excited to have you today. Welcome, Boris, to the Overrule Podcast. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all uh, for having me today. Uh, it's a pleasure. All right, Boris, I hope let's get to jump right into it and have you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself. Where'd you grow up? A little bit about your family and your upbringing. Well, I am not a native New Orleanian. Um, I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois, and uh, my journey here some years ago, um, looking at college opportunities, and um, ideally, back then, I wanted to become a pediatrician, you know, I wanted to be able to, you know, serve impoverished uh, neighborhoods and open up a clinic and in uh, an impoverished neighborhood and, and and just serve the kids. So Xavier University of Louisiana brought me here to New Orleans some years ago, and it still remains true today. It was number one for getting minorities into medical school. And so the intent was to go to medical school from Xavier University. One of the things that we tend to do when we're, we're college students is that we we need part-time jobs, right? We right. want to work and and have a little extra money in our pockets. Um, you know, while we're while we're doing what we need to do as far as uh, the education piece, but we want to have a, a nice social life too. So my parents said, well you need to get a little job. And my first job here in New Orleans while I was in college was working with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities in a group home setting. And that's where you have six or six to eight individuals uh, with a myriad of challenges uh, residing together and the staff are providing 24 hour care to them. So that was my job. Um, one of the individuals whom I was serving in the group home setting um, you know, he really touched my heart. And so as a result of that, I ended up changing my major uh, from biology pre-med um, to psychology uh, pre-med going into my junior year. And my parents weren't very happy, but um, that's how I got started, you know, uh, being from Chicago and I haven't returned home because, you know, in New Orleans, you meet a New Orleans guy, um, they tend to hold on to you. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm a great transplant, but uh, it's been a blessing to serve the greater New Orleans region in a service capacity. It's been a blessing. I'm sure the gumbo and the food didn't hurt, huh, Boris? Uh, <laughs> not at all. Not at all. It, it didn't hurt that I married a, a fabulous uh, guy, you know, too, so... Absolutely. So that's interesting. It sounds like you had that little seed and uh, when you were in school of that like philanthropic kind of volunteer seed that kind of maybe shifted that part of your brain to thinking in that direction. And it's interesting you brought it up because my next question was going to be what kind of pushed you? Um, what else was it that maybe pushed you in the philanthropic 501c3 or, you know, type of service oriented sector? One of the major things that that pushed me was the, you know, the need to see change, you know, uh, impact in a way that um, everyone gets to experience a better quality of life, regardless of their circumstances. And uh, working with the young man whom I worked with uh, while I was in college in a group home setting, I was still doing the good work that God called me to do. Um, you know, it wasn't in any capacity as a pediatrician, but it was in the capacity of being able to assist in transforming someone's life for the better. So um, that's, you know, one of the, the, the pieces of my foundation, um, being able to see a, a need for positive change and substantial impact on folks' lives. 
what do you think, Voris? Um, and, and you have a really excuse me, we'll get into it in a second. You have a significant role now as president and CEO of Volunteers of America, Southeast Louisiana, which is we'll get into the size of the organization and the breadth of it in a minute. Um, but what are some what what did you what did you do before that you think really prepared you for the leadership role that you now sit in as president and CEO? Great if, question. If you can nail it down, you may not be able to nail it down to one thing, right? Yeah, it's several things, um, but I can share that my prior role serving in the capacity of the executive vice president, program operations, um, not only prepared me because I got to see, I was able to see the breadth of the organization as a whole. Um, and, you know, Volunteers of America is a multifaceted, complex organization, which a lot of the folks in the community uh, probably did not realize. I mean, we have 30 plus business lines uh, here at this organization as of uh, today, and we have approximately four to five uh, subsidiaries. Um, and so uh, being in my previous role and served in that capacity, uh, since um, 2002, um, it, it allowed me to understand the service populations, you know, folks living with um, severe mental health issues, people experiencing homelessness, uh, people uh, who are experiencing substance abuse issues and working with the more, more mature crowd. Some people call them elderly. I say the more mature people, um, you know, um, and their needs and being able to have those conversations and how can you develop innovative services for the community that are able to resonate and align with the uh, community needs. Um, you know, having those conversations with various stakeholders definitely assisted me in being able to have the understanding and um, ensuring that I remain with a compassionate heart as I serve. Um, the other uh, key value to it is that I have a business background. Um, so uh, being able to understand that when you're working in an organization that's a not-for-profit, a lot of folks see not-for-profit as charities per se, but right. at the end of the day, we're business. And so we have a double bottom line. We have a social bottom line and we have a financial bottom line. And so operating in the capacity as executive vice president and then my business degrees afforded me the opportunity to understand that it's important that um, you just don't garner resources to be good stewards of it, but you also garner resources so you can pour back into the organization and the community to continue to fulfill the needs and ensure that the sustainability of those services um, are long term. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point, Boris. So I guess you had been vice president for what, about 17 or 18 years before you? Very, became? very long time. I won't yeah. date my age. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look great. So that's not an issue. But, uh, Thank you. <laughs> I, you know, I think it's just a key lesson to be learned, just that small little element of your journey, right? It's like I sometimes see people in business, whether it's in, you know, and it is true. I know it from the inside. VOA is a business and a social component, a huge organization, which you have to manage complex financials and over 300 employees. But in business and philanthropy and different sectors of the economy, it's just the impatience of wanting things to happen overnight. But, mm -hmm. but really what I'm hearing from you is, is along your way is that patience of learning the organization, of learning skills and watching maybe the previous CEO and and other things happening in the organization really laid a strong foundation for you Absolutely. and prepared, prepared you to become the leader that you are today for the organization. Absolutely. And uh, the, the great thing about it is that the previous CEO, Jim LeBlanc, whom um, I succeeded, he had been with the organization for 30 plus years, um, not just here at Volunteers of America Southeast Louisiana, but he served in other capacities um, across the country, um, specifically in Oregon. And uh, so from watching and being able to receive some of that mentoring from him as well, also assisted uh, in my leadership. Um, and so you watch and you learn. And then you also watch and learn from your community partners as well. You learn what to do and what not to do and what can you do and what you can't do, um, how to build capacity to do what's needed. Um, and so 
Uh, and I and I also learn from my peers. And, you know, that's important because we have a one team. Um, you know, you don't garner all the information from just one person in the room. You know, everyone in the room can bring value who sit at the table, as well as uh, the board of directors. That's why it's important to have board of directors who come from varying backgrounds with a vast level of experience. So you can gain insight in being able to uh, bounce ideas and and um, receive suggestions and recommendations and to drive the vision for the org. So there, but you got to have that business mind. That's right. <laughs> they would say, you know, business mind, servant heart, uh, Notre Dame. So, um, you know, that's that's important as well. I also think you really, maybe not even uh, intentionally doing it, um, really describes your leadership style that I've been able to watch both on committees and as a volunteer now on the board is, and I try to do myself as a collaborative leader. And you really are successful at bringing stake, different stakeholders together, different pieces of that organization and outside vendors and, and stakeholders together to reach a singular mission. So what what is your perspective on that, like the, on, on your leadership style and collaborative leadership and, and how effective that is to reach the best ultimate conclusion in business and philanthropy? Volunteers America can't do it alone in the community, first and foremost. Um, I, I think that no organization who uh, has a mission to serve can do it alone um, because we do not have all of the ingredients that are needed. Um, it takes insight from other orgs and businesses of the community. You know, um, it takes the conversations, the much needed crucial conversations um, to discuss uh, what are you know, the, the challenges that they see, some of our business leaders see across the community. When they see some of our populations whom we serve in the community are not where they need to be. Um, so hearing that, having that kind of those conversations and that dialogue, um, it allows us to, to create win-win situations overall for the community. Um, it's not based on what we think. Um, it's based on what er what everyone thinks, but coming to some sort of common ground as to how we can build sustainable uh, programming that's going to meet the needs, how we can develop affordable housing that reflects the community in which we serve, because Volunteers of America Southeast Louisiana serves a 16 parish area. So bringing um, the right people to the table, the stakeholders to the table, not just from New Orleans, not from just, you know, Jefferson Parish, um, you know, because the experiences that we have here in the greater New Orleans area are not the same experiences that are had down in the home of Terrebonne community or in St. John, St. James parishes. So bringing all of those folks from various areas to tell us what they need for their particular community and being able to have them to be a part of that blueprint that we create, uh, it's invaluable. It really is. It's invaluable. Uh, we can't work within a silo so to speak. You can't do that. It takes the entire community to move the community forward. I couldn't agree more. I was hoping, Boris, that you could maybe give our listeners some a brief oversight or perspective on, before we get into VOA and what it does, the size of Volunteers of America, Southeast Louisiana, its structure, what region it serves, and, and its kind of role in this region. Absolutely. Volunteers America, just to let the the, um, the listeners and viewers know, it is a an organization um, that's 127 plus years strong. We started back in 1896, and um, our national office is based in Alexandria, Virginia. And what a lot of folks do not know is that Volunteers America Southeast Louisiana is one of 28 affiliates across the country. And we have Volunteers America, Inc., who serves as a technical support entity to the organizations across the country. We are one of three affiliates in the state of Louisiana. Um, there's Volunteers America, South Central Louisiana and Volunteers America, North Louisiana. Um, we all have our own governing board of directors. 
We operate um, individually in the best way that I can describe it to give you an analogy. It's like a franchise, like a McDonald's. You have the mothership and then you have the franchisees. Volunteers America is a federated organization. Um, Volunteers America Southeast Louisiana has approximately 30 plus programs that we deliver um, across a 16 parish area. We operate with um, almost 500 employees across Southeast Louisiana, and we serve almost 30,000 people across Southeast Louisiana. And so a multitude of programming from providing um, services to, to people who are in a correctional facility, seniors, folks living with mental health issues and all. But then we have our subsidiaries, Renaissance Neighborhood Development Corporation, which is a very large subsidiary of Volunteers of America Southeast Louisiana that, that provides our affordable housing. We have over 14 properties that we have developed and or built within um, the greater New Orleans region and down in Home and Terrebonne uh, parishes in St. Tammany Parish. So when it comes to our housing development uh, arm, we have over $150 million worth of assets there. When it comes to Volunteers America programmatic side, community services in the community, we have been very fortunate to have federal and state grants, um, roughly almost uh, 42 million in order to provide, provide services across the state and specifically our 16 parish area. So we're very large and we're very complex and uh, we have you know, employees who are extremely dedicated, you know, to uh, our mission, uh, which is to reach, reach and uplift all people uh, within our communities we serve. So um, very large organization. You mentioned some of the things that VOA does for us just now. Mm-hmm. So the affordable house, the, the housing properties that it manages and the housing units that it has out there. But I was hoping you could expound a little bit more, not necessarily on everything it does, because the organization does so much. And Mm -hmm. um, but for me, for example, I I remember one of the neat programs that VOA does that kind of blew me away at the first little event that VOA I went to uh, over a decade ago that my old boss brought me to was that VOA would go out to somebody's house and free of charge, just build a wheelchair ramp on their house. Um, I thought that was just so neat because it's just such a small, but to somebody could be a significant cost. Um, And also the hassle of having to outfit that house for wheelchair ramps when somebody has a disability or a problem or an injury or something in their life. And I just thought that was so cool. And that kind of is that small little unique program kind of started me on my interest and piqued my interest about the other neat things that VOA does. So I was hoping you could expound a little bit more on some of the other things that are neat that VOA serves the community with outside of just housing. I'm glad you brought that program up. Um, That program is called our our Craftsman Home Repair Program. And that's where we provide affordable home repair services um, to individuals, um, veterans, seniors, and just the public in general. Uh, We can provide uh, home repairs, minor home repairs, uh, ramps, grab bars, up to $75,000 worth of um, repairs. So we're licensed. Um, and that's a service that, you know, the community at large, a lot of folks aren't aware of. And so we do, you know, small developments there. But beyond that, when I say we cover, we provide services from birth to our more mature crowd, quote unquote, elderly, um, we do it all. You know, our adoption and maternity program, uh, where we serve birth parents and adoptive parents along with um, couples, you know, and provide them the birth mother's uh, maternity care and counseling to the potential adoptive um, couples and and parents. Um, We provide uh, uh, services to seniors where we have community uh, health workers, case managers who work with our more mature crowd in ensuring that their benefits are um, where they need to be and provide them with community resources so that they can age in place. Um, Everyone knows about our auto donation program. You donate your auto to Volunteers America and the proceeds go to fill the financial gaps of the org. Um, Our behavior health services, 
working with folks with mental health issues um, or substance use issues, providing crisis intervention services, as well as uh, case management and counseling services to that population. We also have group homes across the greater New Orleans area, seven group homes, where we work with uh, individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They live um, in those homes, their homes, and we provide care to 54 individuals at one given time, 24-hour care. And then we have a supported living services program where the individuals who have intellectual developmental disabilities want to live on their own or live with their, their family members, we actually deploy the support to their individual homes where we get able to work with them to ensure that their needs are met, either as going to their job or getting out in the community at large. We have our health services support program, whereas we work with folks who are affected by HIV and AIDS. A lot of people may not have known that. We provide that service uh, in St. Tammany Parish, as well as uh, Orleans and Jefferson Parish. Uh, we also have our counseling, private counseling, whereas we can provide counseling to anyone uh, who's in need. It can be marriage, anger management counseling, mental health counseling. And that means that, you know, you don't have to just be a, you know, um, um, you can have any type of insurance and we can provide that care, even private um, pay. We have a medical respite program, whereas we have individuals who are in the hospital and we work with the managed care organizations like um, um, uh, Mary Health Caritas or United Healthcare, uh, whereas individuals in, in the hospital, but they, they can't go home because they have no support there and they need an in-between place, whereas you can service them and in a safe and supportive healing environment. And so we serve as the medical respite so they don't end up back in the hospital sooner than they needed to be. We have a Mentoring Children of Promise program where we're working with individuals, uh, youth, children who may have an incarcerated parent or parents or at-risk youth, and we provide them with a mentor, residential reentry, whereas we're working with, um, um, it's a correctional facility where we work with individuals who are, who are experiencing the last uh, three to six months of their federal sentence in our program, and we work to successfully integrate them back into the community. Um, retired Senior Volunteer Program. I can go on and on and on. We have 30 plus programs and folks are able to access those programs and see all what we do on our website at voaselea.org, voaselea.org. But 30 plus programs across Southeast Louisiana. Um, a lot of folks think that, you know, by us being called Volunteers of America, we're a volunteer organization. We do more than just, you know, provide volunteers. That's a very, very small part of what we do. Our goal is to be able to provide, you know, meaningful, impactful services to the community at large, to a vast group of people across our community. Yeah, you know, I think I was telling Brad the other day, uh, Brad, I, it may have been you, but um. Boris, I, I think I went look at this so specifically on the reentry facility. And yes. this is a it's a really nice facility. I don't know if we have more than one, but there's one in New Orleans that I was able to go and tour. And and you think about the social impact of that, Brad. It's like, you know, we don't want some and people make mistakes, they go to prison, but when they come out, you know, we don't want them to be falling back into anything that maybe led them there or to be going to a, a part of their life where they either get addicted to drugs or crime. We want them to be entered back into society and become productive members of society to go get, you know, to have gainful employment, to work, to be able to, you know, Absolutely. have a good life and, and, you know, pay taxes, be a, you know, a beneficial member of society and, and, and make a difference with the rest of their life when they get out. And that Absolutely. facility is, is such a nice facility and really done such a great job job of doing that. Um, and that's just a small little Yeah, bit. a lot of those programs I did not know about. I was introduced to the VOA through David from going to like some of the breakfasts and stuff that y'all host for the fundraising. And one of the things that struck me, which I didn't know about VOA before, was a lot of the programs, they're not handout programs, they're hand up programs. That's correct. So, so that's it's about correct. giving people some resources. And I know you, you hear these amazing stories at these breakfasts of people who have, you know, they were 
they were helped by VOA and kind of what their path was. They may have had some type of drug addiction or some issue, and it was a safety net to catch them, but not to hold them there. And you give them the tools that are necessary, and then they are they're off the VOA, you know, program, and they're doing well all on their own. And some of those stories were just amazing stories to hear to hear how impactful these programs were for these people and their family and everyone else around them. But yeah, I mean, you can't stress enough how much of it's a hands up, not a hand out type of thing for a lot of absolutely, people. absolutely. And uh, just to highlight one particular program. Um, our veterans program, where we have a residential uh, component to it. And, you know, for the the guys who, and it's an all-male program, um, but for the guys who have, you know, served our country on behalf of us to ensure our freedom, freedom um, this transitional residential program where the you know VA provides 24 months where they can live in this residential service with this residential service. Our goal, because it's a benefit, that, a lifetime benefit that they receive 24 months, in the event they fall on hard times and they experience homelessness, they have a 24 month benefit. Our goal is to reintegrate them back into society less than six months. That means ensuring that they are reconnected with their benefits that they've rightfully earned, um, their VA benefits, ensuring that, you know, if they have employment, if they want to have employment, that they have that and they are in safe and secure permanent housing because we want to preserve those benefits in the event during the rest of their lifetime and they need it. They can use those be- those uh, benefits anywhere throughout the country, any residential facility out the country. So we provide those those employment specialists on staff, case management uh, um, people on staff, as well as counselors to ensure that they get what they need and they utilize their resources so they can permanently live in the community in which they desire with the right supports but it's not a handout it's you know teaching people right you say if you teach someone how to fish um they'll be able to um feed themselves for the rest of their life right so you're teaching them and they have a lot of transferable skill sets as well veterans have a lot of transferable skill sets and which they can utilize in order to successfully reintegrate into the community so very good point it's not a handout yeah that's a good example and somebody asked me what does voa do one time and the way i described it to them and maybe a bad explanation but the way i saw you guys is Y'all kind of pick up where the government fails. You know, the government's really good at issuing checks, but then they let people kind of drop off after that. Y'all are really good at, you know, getting those resources in people's hands and getting them to that next step, getting them to a place where they can support themselves or help themselves. And I feel like that's something our government's not really good at doing. Well, I, I, I'll say this um, because we do receive a lot of government funding, but our goal is excellence. It's not basic. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that we want people to be able to have their confidence restored, um, be it, you know, folks to understand that they do have the ability to thrive. um, And Volunteers America is able to help them with that, to, you know, get their confidence restored, be able to see that they can live independently in the community successfully, Um, you know, training. You know, because a lot of times we take for granted what people need because we're viable individuals in the community. We're thriving. Um, But understanding what their needs are and being able to identify how they can assist in meeting those needs with limited supports is invaluable, invaluable. You know, when people become a part of Volunteers of America, we say, you know, you're part of an organization that believes in ensuring that you can thrive and survive uh, in the community if you have the right supports behind you. So we we act as gung-ho fans for folks, you know, um, to support them. So and, and then they believe in it. And then they become valuable supporters for the future, too. They want to give back and pay it forward. For the other folks, we hire people, you know, whom we've served, 
Um, it's a testament to what we believe our work is. Um, we employ folks um, who we serve, um, and we're going to continue to do that as well. Yeah, and I have to say before we get off the services, and I am in a second with my next question, you know, another thing I think our listeners need to know that VOA does, which is so neat between all the services to veterans, is they will go into a veteran's house and re-outfit their bathroom and or kitchen and other areas of the property Yes. Um, if, if there's a disability that they suffered um, on the battlefield, which is really an incredible service and, and, and an awesome thing that VOA is doing. I, I was hoping to shift gears here a little into your leadership role there, Boris, and, mm-hmm. and ask you, you've been on the job. You, I mean, you just mentioned, obviously, you're running an organization of over 500 employees, complex uh, different subdivisions in real estate holding companies with a lot of stakeholders, both internally and externally. Even though you had such a great foundation before you started the job as president and CEO, I got to believe there's one or two lessons that you've learned in the last two or three years as CEO. What are some that maybe stand out in your mind, of the one or two lessons you've learned in, in your role as CEO? You know, this is something that... Um that, you know, it it stood out even more in my CEO role, but I knew it prior to my CEO role, (laughs) my CEO role. And um, Jim used to say this and and, um, I embraced it as well. Um, Trust, but verify. I don't know if you all know who that came from. Trust, but verify. Um, Ronald Reagan said that years ago, trust, but verify. You can trust that a person is going to do what they need to do, but it's your responsibility to ensure that you verify that it's done. Um, That's important because at the end of the day, you're accountable, right? So that is something that um, um, has resonated now, you know, more than ever um, because uh, my three pillars for the, for the organization, integrity, transparency, and accountability, integrity, transparency, accountability. And I keep repeating it. I send it out in my Friday messages um, in communication throughout the organization. I communicate with the staff every Friday. So it's important, right? You have to Do what you say you're going to do. So um, on those three pillars, trust, but verify. And then the other thing I would say that I I realized all money is not good money. Okay, all money is not good money. We may have some financial gaps, but we're going to align ourselves with those individuals who truly believe in those businesses who truly believe um, in our mission. And so if that means we have to work a little harder to fill those financial gaps, we will do that. Because if those um, those dollars are not aligned, then we're not we're compromising who and what we are today. And I will not do that. Not in this seat. (laughs) Yeah, it's such a good lesson, because, I mean, that that extends not just in in what Volunteers of America is doing from the standpoint of fundraising and, and bridging gaps, right, to to provide the critical services to the community and serving others that BOA is doing. <clears throat> but it really extends right to business. I mean, it doesn't matter what type of industry you're in. That's correct. Just, just because you have an investor who's coming in or uh, somebody who wants to offer you a loan and, and they're, the money's all green and it all right. is the same. But that doesn't mean that you're in, that you're aligned with them. And it doesn't mean that they're the right partner or the right person to right. be doing business with. They can quickly become a poison. <laughs> yeah. yes. yes, that's correct. And that's a lot correct. of people have learned that. I think we've all maybe learned that the hard way is is and you learn from your mistakes, right? You fall down, you get back up. Is I'm not, I'm not doing that anymore, right? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, um, th- the other thing that uh, a lot of folks don't know is that Volunteers of America is a faith based organization. So um, it's imperative um, that um, we we align ourselves with um, businesses and individuals who believe in uplifting people and ensuring that they want their communities to thrive um, because it takes collective work, collective uh, energy, uh, you know, people at the tables to, to draw progress. And we want to draw progress. You know, we've been here for 127 plus years and, you know, we want to be here another 
127 plus. So, and having the right people in our organization who want to do that great work, right? We, you know, we want to give 110% and have people around the table who want to do the same. So, Boris, one of the last couple of questions I have for you, and this is going to be, I know, a tough one for you, very humble person, but I like to always put uh, our guests on the spot every now and then and ask them, what is their superpower? And by that, I mean what they think is maybe that one unique trait that they have, that that personality trait, that ability that they have that has really helped them succeed along their journey and is helping them in their role today. So if you had to peg it down to one thing, what would you say is your superpower? Discernment. I believe I've been blessed with the spirit of discernment. Discernment. That's a good one. Uh, I have a strong faith um, foundation. And, um, um, you know, I, I, I would like to think that, you know, my decisions are, are based on what I'm able to discern what's good and what's not good for the bet- betterment of the York. So discernment. That's, that's, a, that's a great one. Great tool. Uh, kind of plays into um I, I call I, I call it like my your gut instinct, right? Is yes. Like, where's yes. your gut, where's <laughs> yes. your gut leading you when you kind of like observe yes. this thing and really take <laughs> all it. the factors into consideration. Um, yeah. one one last question I have for you, Boris, is what is what is one thing, and you may not have one, but mm-hmm. we talked about your role your role um starting back in your journey starting back in Xavier all the way to now being the CEO of a, a organization of over 500 employees what is um one thing you wish you knew when you started this journey oh that's a great question <laughs> it's hard <laughs> i'm begging you yeah. on. you may not one thing one. i wish i knew when i started the journey years ago correct that's it. that's it okay I would say I wish I knew that all people aren't good. I wish I knew that back then. And that's a that's a that's a interesting comment. And and I tell you why it's interesting to me. You know, I come at I probably am too trusting. Mm-hmm. I think Brad yes. Kelly is there you too. go. And that's so, aligned with what I'm saying. <laughs> I think <laughs> I have trust. I have learned that lesson myself too, right? Is to be right. It kind of is almost dovetailing with some, one of your pillars, right? Like trust but yes. verify. Yes. Uh, and so age and wisdom have kind of imported a little bit on me on not necessarily being as trusting and believing that everyone always has a good motive or is a good person, like you said. So that's a fantastic. I think that's yes. one lesson you learn through experience the hard way, no matter who you are. <laughs> when 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 you have a compassionate heart. You tend to give a lot more grace, but it's not always um, it should not always be expected to get it. Right. So um, and that's where the trusting part comes in. When you're too trusting, that's when things can go wrong. A hundred percent. And I mean, just seeing it in in so many contexts, just in what we do. Right. Is. Yeah. And it's like the classic trope, for example, in like a business litigation dispute where it's like you have a couple of partners, one of them is just trusting the other partner is not paying attention to the books right. going on in the bank account. <laughs> Somebody's in Tahiti. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, it's no, excellent, excellent point. Well, Boris, thank you so much for everything that you're doing in the community. I mean, I just see it um, since I've been involved in the organization over many years now. Um, and, you know, I can just say from my own personal experience, when I sell the organization to people, I know that this is not an organization that's funneling money to people to work for it, um, who are taking the money away from the people who need it. This is an organization that is strong, well-organized, and really singularly focused on serving the community in many different aspects. So thank you for everything that y'all are doing in the Southern Louisiana community. I see it. It's incredible. And especially for you, as as the as I've watched over the last two or three years as the CEO and leader of it, for all the awesome things you're doing as a leader, you have a ton of great qualities that I really admire and look up to. And I see the day-to-day impact that it's having on the organization. So thanks for what you're doing. And most of all, thanks for being with us here today on Overruled and discussing it with us. I want to thank you all both uh, um, for believing in Volunteers of America and its work. And um, David, the time you've spent, you know, um, investing in Volunteers of America, it does not, you know, go go unnoticed. Um, And we continue to need um, 
people who who have compassionate hearts and people who believe in the great work um, that we do to, uh, you know, align themselves with us. And you all have done that. And so I want to thank you all for that and also giving me the space and time to share Volunteers of America's story today. Um, truly appreciate it. For our listeners who want to get more involved with VOA or want to contribute, what's the easiest way for them to reach you guys or get involved? Um, yes, they can contact um, our office, 504-482-2130, area code 504-482-2130. That is our administrative office. We have several offices across um, the 16 parish area, as well as they can visit our website, www.voa sela.org, voasela.org. And we are also on all social media outlets uh, from LinkedIn to Twitter to Facebook, Instagram, you name it, we're part of it. We want to get our story out there. Fantastic. Well, thanks again for being with us, Voris. Thanks to all our listeners for listening today. This has been the Overruled Podcast brought to you by the Scott Vignier Law Firm. Uh, on behalf of myself, Dave Vignier, and my co-host, Brad Scott, thank you all for listening today. Go check out Volunteers of America, a great organization. We look forward to having you in the next time. See you soon. Everybody take care. Scott Vignier, injury attorneys, we fight for the win. Information is for illustrative purposes only and does not constitute tax, investment, or legal advice. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal, or tax professional before taking any action.